Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very exciting plenary session. We've heard it all throughout this week, and I'm delighted that it's here. I am your MC for today, Jennifer LeBron, the leader of the USAID Higher Education Learning Network, the H-E-L-N, which we call the HELEN, and I am delighted to see you all here. In this session, we are going to turn the stage over to three extraordinary youth who will be sharing through visual storytelling their journeys through higher education to employability. We've asked each of them to prepare a short story with images to tell us about their experiences in higher education institutions that incorporated employability programs into the curriculum and how these programs affected their future employment. After these visual stories, our panelists will engage in conversation with our moderator, uh, for this session, Dr. Rebecca Ward. Dr. Ward is a senior technical advisor in the education practice at IREX and has worked on a wide range of programs globally to build universities, to build university industry linkages, strengthen universities' employability support, and improve teacher preparation and career paths. Prior to joining IREX, Rebecca worked in the UK higher education sector, promoting university industry engagement, including the development of higher level skill partnerships between industry associations and education institutions. I am excited to see these stories, Rebecca, but if you could start us off and sort of lay the groundwork for this session, I so appreciate it. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I am really happy to be introducing a panel of young people to share their own experiences of their journey um, from school to work. And I don't know about others in the room, but I do occasionally frighten myself when I realise that more than two decades have passed um, since I graduated from university. And I think the world of work has changed considerably since then. And of course, it can look very different for, for different people. Um, we know it takes an average of 11.6 months for young people to find their first job. And oftentimes, this is not their desired desired job, it's not their ultimate goal. Um, and periods of informal work, short-term work and inactivity often play an important part of this journey. Yet we also know that many of the support packages that we put in place still assume a very kind of linear journey, and um, which doesn't reflect the reality of the, the experiences of, of many young people. And sometimes this false narrative of that kind of really neat quick linear journey into the, the world of formal work and can actually cause harm and exacerbate mental health challenges that make it even harder to find work. Um, and it is a really tough context out there for many. Um, in Kenya, the employment rate amongst degree holders has declined from around 80% um, in 2011 to 13% in 2017. Um, and in Iraq, IREX recently conducted a survey of university graduates and 75% of those surveyed were unemployed. And more recently, COVID and global instability are likely to have ripple effects um, for some time to come. And so for many young people, this transition has become longer, harder and less certain. So for those of us with an interest in supporting school to work transitions, and especially those of us who are maybe a little bit further down that path than we would like, um, it is really important that we continually check back in with young people um, to understand their lived experiences and to engage them in the process of reflecting on what's going to work and, and what kind of solutions should be designed. So to that end, we have three really great panelists for you today to talk about just that. Um, Mariam Nihad is 22 years old uh, and lives in Basra in Iraq. She graduated from Basra University for oil and gas with a bachelor's degree in oil and gas engineering. Kevin Andura is 28 years old and lives in Nairobi, Kenya. He graduated with a BSc in Health Services Management from Kenyatta University. And Rashane Bartley is 23 years old from Portmore, Jamaica. He graduated from the University of Technology, um, where he studied for an associate degree in entertainment design and production technology. 
and they're each going to share with you their own experiences of the journey from school to work. And, and as they do this, I encourage everybody to reflect on what these stories mean for your practice. Uh, what can you do differently in your sphere of influence? What can we all do differently collectively? Um, to better support young people as they navigate this really transition, uh, challenging transition. So this is really a call to action. Um, and before we wrap up this session, after everybody has shared their stories, we'll be asking everybody to share their personal resolutions and commitments on a whiteboard. Um, but without further ado, I will first hand over to Mariam to share her story. Mariam, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to share with you my employment journey. Before entering college, my ambition was to work in petroleum engineering. As most of you know, Iraq relies totally upon oil and gas industry. My goal was to become a part of this sector, which is a full of opportunities that open the door to distinction. Through my college years, my soft skills were cultivated and shaped to be suitable skills for work life. Our university is known for its focus on the professional courses that reach to high knowledge and also develop a different perspective of a student for knowledge, personality, and soft skills. I acquired a good technique, I acquired a good leadership skills and effective communication through the activities and sessions that we had. Also, I acquired a good technical skills, specifically those needed by industry, like how to write professional researches and reports. Also, our university focused on work-based learning. One of the most important things in my journey from school to work was a inter summer internship provided by our company where I was exposed to the world of work. I had the opportunity to train, to train at oil our service is a provider company, Schlimmer J, and it was one of the most spectacular experience that I ever had, but filled with the challenges. At the beginning, entering the workplace as a student, thought it would be easy, but as soon as we, but Schlimmer J has a strict system. As soon as we took the safety course, we had duties to do. It was a whole different thing from studying. We were responsible for our actions. I found that a positive attitude and the hard work were the foundation of company employee. It was a steep learning curve, but I enjoyed this project, which shaped me to learn commitment, discipline, manage my time, land in motion, and how to be patient through the hard times. I earned this chance to apply my knowledge in the real workplace, and it was a hugely valuable experience. And I was one of the lucky ones. The internship enabled me to demonstrate my skills, commitment, and build, build a relationship with colleagues, also, I was hired as a full-time maintenance engineer by Schlimmer J, the same role I had in the training. The summer internship was the period, or the period uh, transition period from studying to working. So by the time I was employed as a full-time employee, I was almost completely aware of the work, of the world of work. My expectations were matched and I adapted to the work. I recognized that all needed is dedication and resistance to work, success and the hard work. As I think back on my journey, two things struck me as important. The first, our universe known to have a close relationship with oil and gas companies. So I was confident the courses I was taking were preparing me well to find a job. The knowledge and the skills that developed through the university years expanded my vision. The second, the internship helped me to develop work-based skills and build, build the network that I needed to find a full-time job. But I believe the biggest, uh, the biggest success factor of all comes from within and having curiosity, energy, and eagerness to learn is what made me part of Schlimmer J. Thank you. Now we'll move on to Kevin. Thank you, Mariam. And uh, my story is from a happy ending point. I'm currently employed as a data analyst at Ascent, a Canadian-based company. However, it's been a long journey to get here. And looking back, you can now see the relevance of the opportunities provided by my school, Kenyatta University. I joined campus to study health services management, hoping to find a dream job that paid well, 
in the health sector. While in school, I was proactive in participating in the opportunities offered by Kenyatta University, where I took part in the career week. This offered CV writing, professional branding, and networking skills. In addition, the school department offered free usage classes in monitoring and evaluation to complement my curriculum or my third year studies. As final year students, we were given an additional leadership course to facilitate our transition into the job market. The school father provided me with an internship at a local hospital called Madare in my third year of study to familiarize myself with the work environment. They scheduled it so that I spent almost two weeks in every department within the school to ensure that I had comprehensive work practice within the health setup. Only after completing school and starting the job hunt was when I realized how important these experiences were. But the journey wasn't easy. The transition from school was tough and tedious. It was completely opposite to my expectations while at the university. Frustrations arose from silence to, by employers. I would get the usual auto reply. We received the application for the role. However, due to the large number of applications, we shall only respond to the shortlisted candidates. This happened for close to one and a half years. At some point, I stopped applying for jobs because the effort seemed fruitless. My mom was my support structure during this time, where I went hustling for jobs down the streets of Nairobi, hoping this was the lucky one to land me a job. Growing from the networks I made during the career week, including my mentor that I stayed in touch with, I eventually landed my first volunteer program with UNDP, which was a paid role. Growing on what I learned from the career week, I ensured I networked further and did my best to acquire more skills within the temporary job offer, which lasted 10 days. This, along with my internship, helped secure my first full-time job as a data specialist at Cloud Factory. As I reflect on this journey, my factors, the factors that ensured my success in getting a job was my proactiveness in networking while in school, the art of professional branding, and networking within school activities. It was these opportunities offered by the school that contributed majorly to my first job offer. They enabled me to portray my competence and convince a panel of my suitability for the role, countering a common fallacy that you must know someone or pay a bribe to land a job. My networks led me to apply for the position, but I'm confident that I secured it on merit alone. Um, thank you and uh, over to you, Rajin. Um, hello everyone. My name is Rashane Bartley. I am from Portmore in Jamaica. I currently work in the media and production industry as a LED and lighting tech. Um, my story and how I became a LED tech was an unforeseen one. Actually, after leaving high school in 2018, I wanted to become an electrical engineer, but because of financial circumstances, I couldn't attend. So I then opted to go to a skill-based institute here in Jamaica. While at the institute, I heard about a scholarship um, offered by the advanced program and funded by USAID for a degree in entertainment, design, and production technology. So after, after hearing about the scholarship, I signed up. Um, I went in for, for, for the internship um, interview. Um, about two weeks later, I got a call that I was accepted to the university. And this, I must say, was my first step to higher education. Um, as it relates to employability skills, um, at the first instances uh, being at the university, I learned um, soft skills such as leadership, um, teamwork, um, due to um, meeting new people, having group works, late night study sessions. I even um, learned um, technical skills such as audio production, lighting production, and stage designing. And throughout the whole corona pandemic, 
I also got to speak with lead lighting te technicians virtually, such as Nadia Augsburg, which gave me a more further outlook on how things were in the production industry. As it relates to my bridges to employment, I was fortunate enough that after leaving university, I got a paid internship at one of Jamaica's leading production companies, Phase 3 Production. Um, while at the company, I got to learn more hands-on knowledge of the theoretical um, education I had at the university. So this hands-on um, hands situation gave me a more better outlook of what the production industry is like. And my transition into employment now was, it was pretty much good because uh, after finishing my internship at phase three production, I, they decided to let me stay on board. So I was already familiar with the team, how, how work is done there, how crew call is done, the whole production system. I was already familiar with it. So the transition into the work was okay for me. And looking at looking back at it now, um, one of my um, main factors, I must say that my biggest factors now is I can say um, do, doing a job back then in, in Montego Bay around in April, coming back and the, the manager um, applauded me for a, a, a job well done. So one of that was my biggest success factor so far. And even I must say now being able to provide in the household to just practically paying a bill or so. So those are the things I look back at and say is my biggest success factor so far. Um, back to you, Rebecca. Rashane, th thank you so much. Kevin and Marion, thank you for sharing your stories. I mean, it's so gratifying that they're all from a really successful ending point, but it's not been easy for all of you. And, and so much of what you were talking about in your stories resonate with me. And I can see there's been some great comments coming through in the chat. When I think about what you're saying, I'm thinking about the real importance of building relationships with industry to create relevant curriculum. Um, I think the value of internships is coming through strongly, both for building skills and building your networks as you kind of make your way in the world of work, but also as a really valuable tool for employers as a recruitment tool as well. You know, they almost get to try before they buy um, and you've been able to demonstrate the, the success and the talent that you're bringing to the table. Um, I think the role of personal branding came through really strongly, Kevin, in, in your story and building the skills to do it effectively. Um, but also the challenge and the kind of tenacity and persistence that has been needed to, to kind of arrive at your successful ending point. So, you know, I think as we reflect on, on your stories, we need to think about how do we build those skills of resi resiliency and proactivity among young people as they're preparing for their transition into work. So really that's been a, a super inspiring um, set of reflections for me. And I do have a few questions to, to dive in a, a little bit deeper. Um, so, Mariam, you mentioned that, you know, your internship was a really great experience, but also challenging. Um, I'm interested to know what the main challenges were for you and whether you felt kind of adequately prepared and supported to, to meet these challenges and what your most important sources of support were. Uh, answering, answering this question. I think one of the challenging was how to gain respect and your knowledge. But the hardest thing, but the hardest thing was studying while uh, working, while, studying while working. We, we, we need to study many materials to understand the job we do. We, there were a few hours to study, do office work, to rest it through. So I was working under the pressure, but it remind me of a code, pure pressure, does not fear fire and the way to reach its perfection. And another thing to mention, 
as a female, it was not an easy to, to work in the energy sector due to the long hours of work and constant getting away from family life, which make the contribution of females in the sector limited. Um, and yes, I was adequately prepared for a freshly graduated engineer. I used to study all the time and it was not easy either. Also, my family and all the people around me were a source of support for me to thrive beyond all the challenges. Uh, this support could be a word, but in the right time, it has a, a tremendous impact. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Thank you, Mariam. I love that you are kind of flying the flag for non-traditional gender roles. Um, it, it's brilliant. And I think it's also interesting that you mentioned the support of your family, because I think that came through in Kevin's story too, you know, the role of your mum, Kevin, in providing that support structure um, that you needed as you made the transition. And I think that's a really important takeaway for me too. Um, Kevin, turning to you, many of the opportunities that are provided by your university were, were optional, so they weren't an integral part of your degree. What was it that made you take up these opportunities when maybe other students chose not to? Um, thank you, Becky. So I'd like to say focus on my career, but I know that the influence which my lecturer, who was also my mentor, did in joining the several activities and events sparked my curiosity. His constant reminders and support throughout made me understand its importance. I know that over time, I grew to learn to, learn to take part in them because of the long-term benefits I knew they would provide when I started my career after school. Thank you, Becky. Yeah, thank, thanks, Kevin. And I think, you know, personal kind of proactivity is coming through really strongly there. So thinking about how, how can we build that kind of mindset and skill set in students as they're going through their, their university life, I think, is, a, is another important takeaway um, for, for me. Rashane, you're currently participating in an internship, so you're kind of still to make that step into long term formal work. How, how are you feeling about your next steps? And um, do you feel like the internship is providing you with the skills and the networks that you need as you kind of make that transition into long term formal work? Well, definitely, Rebecca. Um, as I said, the university taught me more about theoretical um, knowledge and the basis of production. Being on the internship gave me more hands-on knowledge of how the equipment work, how the whole production system work in a physical aspect. And in terms of possible employment, um, um, this week, um, Monday, um, the manager actually said to me that she will want me to stay on board. So, so Rashane, I think everybody's just really excited to hear that news. And I think that's new since the last time we spoke as well. So many congratulations on that. I think that is um that was fantastic news. And, and again, it's another example, you know, alongside Mariam of how internships can be a really important and useful recruitment tool for, for companies because they manage to work with staff before they kind of make that commitment to a long-term higher and it's had all of these great advantages to you too so I feel like I'm on quite quite a high now that's that's what that's really brilliant news and as we wrap up I have a general question for for all of you so you know ultimately in the long term your experiences have all led to success um but what do you wish would have been different about your school to work journey um, do you wish you'd had different experiences different opportunities different support structures what what do you wish would have been different and um, i'll start with you mariam thank you betty uh, for me i wouldn't change a thing the transition period where a curve binding learning and working together each one of them can leave the other but if it's possible, I would like to talk about the transition from school to work in general. I found it 
It is a cooperation process between companies and students that need the effort from both sides. The companies have the right to hire skilled and experienced employee to the sake of the work, but there could be a much, a much potential wasted by creating a gap in this, tra this transition for a freshly graduated student. So I believe that providing internship could help both sides in this matter. For companies to, to select a good employees uh, with the sense of belonging to this company, and for a student to develop and gain a new perspective of work life. Thank you, Vicky. So, thanks, Mariam. Kevin, how about you? Um, I'd actually maybe like to add maybe three points. So I'd say maybe a mentorship for students as early as high school, and this is to nurture their career at an early age to align their dreams with the reality of the job market. And um, introducing internships as early as first year to provide the students with their own the job work experience. I believe that this exposure would be priceless. And finally, um, in line with also what Mariam said is incorporating the industry job experience and needs into teachable experience for the campus curriculum. This would enable the youths, this would help the youths by equipping them with the right set of tools to match the job market needs. Thank you, Becky. Thanks, Kevin. And Rashane, what about you? Well, well for me, um, Becky, um, during my years at the university, um, there was a corona pandemic. So for me, I wish that wasn't a thing. Um, if it wasn't a thing, I would get a more feel of the university environment, um, more networking, get to go into the work world with a more um, hands-on knowledge. But then again, um, as I said, Phase three productions really at the internship, they really helped me towards um, gaining that hands on knowledge. So, um, the whole corona pandemic thing is the only thing I would um, change about my time. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks again for sharing such, um, such brilliant insights. I think, Mariam, I really love how you frame it as a collaboration between students and companies. And, I think that's actually a really helpful framing because often when we're trying to design support programs, we think a lot about incentives. Um, so, you know, what can get people and particularly businesses around the table and thinking in terms of collaboration, you know, immediately implies shared expectations and shared benefit. And I think that the stories you're all sharing today really demonstrates that. Um, so they show how there's a lot of value to employers in, in engaging with universities on these issues. And maybe that can help us as we're, we're starting to, to think about how to improve support packages. And I think Kevin, as you say as well, there's a real benefit to employers if they tell universities and they tell young people what skills they need. Um, I also really like your reflection, Kevin, that maybe this support needs to come sooner and um, maybe university is too late. And, and I really thoroughly agree with that because you can kind of get locked into a particular pathway by virtue of the program of study that you choose. So I think, you know, that raises a really important question when we're thinking about the support ecosystem, um, do we need to be looking at the relationships between universities and secondary schools too? And I think often that can be kind of left out of the, the picture. And then Rashane, I mean, you raised the, the elephant in the room, the, the really important point about COVID that your experience and, and the experience of millions of other young people around the world has been really quite significantly different um, from those who didn't have to deal with the pandemic. And, you know, also we're in the midst because of the pandemic of this seismic shift in the way that we work and, and where we work from. So we really do need to kind of unpick and, and get to grips with what that means for young people who are currently on this kind of learning to earning journey. So I really hope that we're all feeling inspired by this um, great panel of young people and the ideas and experiences that they've brought forward. As we wrap up this session, we want to invite you all in our audience to share a resolution, to share a commitment 
to apply what you've learned from hearing these experiences to your own com context to, to support student employability. Um, so we're going to use a Padlet for this activity. It's the same tool that we've been using to share our further learning interests each week. Um, I can see that the link has just been shared in the chat. If you click on the link and open Padlet in another window, um, you can then use the plus button in the bottom right hand corner to write a resolution. You can add an image if you would like. Um, if you're willing to connect with anybody else with whom you could collaborate on your resolution, um, then please do add your name, uh, potentially contact details so that they can follow up with you afterwards. Um, I'm going to give us a quiet minute to, to do this so that we can all go and turn what we've heard into action. So it's great that we're already seeing a resolution up there to encourage donors um, to engage youth early uh, and in activity design. And I couldn't agree with that more. Yeah, and that point in the bottom left hand corner, that, that's really central to this idea that there's a, a collaboration that we can talk about here. This is not just about feeling that we're going to employers again and again to ask them to do something that they don't have time to do. Um, really, there's value in it for them and, and being able to frame it in that way, I think, is, is a really important takeaway. Yeah, I found that striking too, that, you know, we, we maybe provide all of these opportunities to do things like internships and um, maybe not thinking about the workload and the stress that it puts on individuals. Um, you know, how can they study and work at the same time and look after their mental health? Um, so I think that's a, a great resolution too. Yeah, encouraging companies to hire internships. Yeah, we're just in the process at IREX of um, launching our summer internship scheme. And I think that um, every company that's able to do so should um, consider providing these kind of opportunities to bring young people in to diversify our workplaces as well as um, providing more opportunities. Okay, so now that I'm seeing many people have already added an, an initial resolution, we now want you to kind of take a look at what others have shared. Um, and you can connect your post to other posts by clicking on the three dots at the top right hand side of your post and selecting connect to a post and then pressing connect. Um, over the note that you want to connect to and you can provide an optional label for the connection and I think that at the moment Jennifer is just starting to demonstrate that facility and um, so that we can start to see kind of patterns and connections and themes on the resolution wall. So I'll give us all another couple of minutes um, to be reviewing what others have written and to be making those connections. I'm seeing a lot of listening to youth in here, which is great because it's just been a kind of recurring theme. Um, all through the conference and particularly the last couple of days. So it's great to see that kind of commitment going forward, very well aligned with the, the launch this week of USA's new youth um, 
policy. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, I would encourage you to do so. Very much centered on engaging youth in the design as, as real decision makers and, and part of the process. Yeah, bringing employers into the classroom. I think that's that's a really kind of great, fairly light touch way that we can engage employers. And that's that's something that we found to work quite well in program designs, that you have to be able to provide a whole range of opportunities for employers to engage in workforce issues in the university so that they can kind of right size it to the resources that they had available, the time and the commitment that they're willing to put forward to it. And that can be a great kind of really light lift to have people come in to, to speakers guest speakers on programs. Okay, I think we probably are at the stage where we need to move on. It's very difficult to judge time uh, when you're, you're facilitating that type of session, but it's great to see that there's so many uh, great thoughts there on very actionable things to move forward. So I really do thank you all um, for sharing your resolutions to support youth in their journeys to employment. And hopefully there's lots of inspiration here that you can take away to reflect on for your own practice. Um, do feel free to keep this link open if you want to continue to read the resolutions after this session or to continue um, adding to them. But with a final note of thanks to our panelists, um, Mariam, Kevin and Roshane, really thank you for the time that you've put into this and, and bringing your thoughtful insights and experiences forward. We really do appreciate it. Um, and I will now hand back over to our MC, Jennifer, who will help us to close out the day. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I, first of all, I just have to say, wow, that was, I, I'm so inspired. I, um, I just feel like, you know, I want to say thank you so much to, to Rashane, to Kevin, to Miriam for being willing to share your stories with us. And, um, I think through them really demonstrating not only the power of higher education to transform lives, but remind us all of why we are here, which is to be a part of young people's journeys. Um, so thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to uh, Dr. Rebecca Ward for your help in bringing this group of people together and for your expert facilitation of that conversation. It was really fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, we are going to spend the last few minutes of this plenary session engaging in what we like to call our synthesis of the day. So these reflections help us think about what we've learned from the day and challenge us to think about how we can use this knowledge moving forward. Um, so to offer our youth reflection, I am delighted to introduce Ananya Singh, who is currently a master's degree candidate in development and labor studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, India. Ananya is an economist in the making who is active in USAID's Youth Power 2 learning and evaluation community. She is also the founder of Project SIS, which aims to develop a digital defense lab for young children, especially girls, in order to enable them to deftly explore and harness the untapped opportunities in the digital economy while keeping a safe distance from digital threats. Such important work. Uh, in 2021, Ananya was recognized with the Diana Award for her humanitarianism and social action. And with that, I'd love to turn this over to you for your reflections, Ananya. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining today's sessions. I'm sure you found all of these sessions to be interesting, insightful, and very, very impactful, as I did. Um, well, I belong to the class of 2020, and 2020 was the Chinese year of rat, which traditionally marks a year brimming with wealth and surplus. But what I and billions of others got instead were disease, distress, and deaths. Fresh graduates like me couldn't find employment anywhere because businesses were either downsizing or shutting down altogether. While we can't blame the employers for not recruiting during a depression, we also can't afford to ignore the vulnerable position of entry-level job seekers. No doubt, 
that the pandemic made it abnormally difficult to find a job in the first place. But the category that's been bearing the brunt of jobs are hard to come by since a couple of years now is that of the youth. I'm a master's degree student of development and labor studies, and this is what I have come to understand. We have fallen into the habit of comfortably blaming labor for not being able to land a job. We accuse them of not being educated enough, of not being skilled enough, of not being persistent enough, or even worse, of not being patient enough. But is it always the labor which is at fault for not having a job? What distances one from employability may not be a creation of his own, but rather the cruel interplay of the market forces. For example, 48% of the engineering graduates in India are unemployed. Now, being hopeful that an additional degree would grant them an edge in next year's hiring market and a potential salary boost, many of these people apply to graduate programs, especially MBA programs. Interestingly, 45% of the management graduates in India are also unemployed. This means that students are more likely to take on more and more loans only to re-enter a highly compromised labor market. And this is not just the case in India. Today, while attending the session on improving employability of university graduates in Morocco, one thing that caught my attention was how horizontal mismatch in terms of lack of soft skills and language proficiency had proven to be significantly challenging for the graduate students' employability in Morocco. In fact, the problem was so dire to the extent that the unemployment rate for people with a higher education diploma was more than the unemployment rate of those without a higher education diploma. So most probably, it's not the labor which is to be at the blame here. There's a clear disconnect between what is taught in our classrooms and what is needed in the labor market. And this gap must be bridged. Otherwise, higher education will become redundant in the face of repeated blows to employability. Hence, we must focus not just on enhancing the employability of labor via skill development, but also focus on administering training on industry relevant, flexible, up to date skills to the future labor force, which is in our classrooms right now. One of the actions hence taken in Morocco was to correct the such situation with increased emphasis on creating a renewed university structure that readily used digital resources and involved potential recruiters to give students with relevant soft skills attuned to regional, national, and international job market needs. Hence, university industrial linkages, UILs, will have a key role to play in the future employability of our labor force. Such a synergy shall act as a mediator and modulator of skill development, help in strengthening of R&D and promotion of entrepreneurship. Companies should reach out to colleges to figure out what their current candidates are learning and then help align the curriculum to uh, their entry-level hiring needs. This way, entry-level candidates will have the skills that employers demand. Given that the USAID higher education programming prioritizes for providing quality and relevant education and training, it will be of prime importance to ensure that each word that is uttered in a classroom makes sense in the industry that is a mile away from it. Hence, the USAID could begin by promoting and facilitating the university industry linkages through its higher education programming so as to ensure that no pupil in our classroom today ends up in the list of people without jobs tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ananya. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for um, sharing your knowledge and your perspective and your expertise and, and really your clarion call. I think this is, I can tell your passion and I and your expertise in this area. And I just really appreciate your perspectives on how we can support employability of graduates and how we can change structures and not put blame on the youth for this problem. There's a lot of things that we can do to support them. So thank you again for being here. And thank you so much um, for for all of your for all of your knowledge that you've shared with us today. So uh, we are nearing the end of our second full week of the summit, and uh, we are closing out our last day of our employability theme. And so I think now is the perfect time to ask you, in five words or less, what is your biggest takeaway from today? So to help us see your responses, there's a link in the chat now, uh, which will 
uh, bring you to our Slido tool. We've used this in, in many other sessions. Um, what I'd like you to do is to click on the link in that chat to join the Slido and to answer this question. In five words or less, tell us what your biggest takeaway is from today. I really would love to see what we've learned. I feel like I have learned so much um, in that process. And I'm seeing some comments in the chat as well, but if you welcome you to join us in the Slido too, I'll give you a, a minute to add your responses in five words or less. Tell us what your biggest takeaway is from today. Wonderful. I'm seeing industry connections to students. Absolutely, heard that loud and clear from so many of our speakers throughout the day today. Um, internships, absolutely. I myself benefited from internship when I was in, in school. Bridge education and employment across all stratas, yes. Soft skills training. Right, leadership, communication skills, entrepreneurship skills, you know, all of these, these soft skills that um, not just give candidates the ability to project confidence into the workforce, but really um, give them the ability to, to uh, engage in ways that are meaningful for them. Yeah. And emotional support, 100%. We, we saw it from Roshane's story earlier, the, the impact of COVID and, and many other crises, many other um, things around the world that can impact students, understanding that emotional support um, is critical in these transitions from, from school to work um, and, and many other transitions in life. Engaging youth, 100%. I absolutely agree. Uh, I, I, I'm so excited that we've had youth be part of our summit every day. I'm delighted that we had this panel today to, to share their stories. Often we, we forget or we think we know, especially if we've been out, out of school for a while, like myself too, engaging youth um, to solve these problems. I heard a wonderful session earlier today that was talking about participatory action research with youth, bringing them into the process of identifying and solving problems is critical. Wonderful. Keep on adding any other takeaways that you have, five words or less as we move on. Um, but thank you all so much for participating. I. I think it's really meaningful and really helpful as we, you know, get immersed in all of this evidence, all of these stories, all of this knowledge that we're sharing with each other to take a moment to pause and reflect, to help us process what we've learned and to really think about what we want to do in the future. Um, and speaking of the future, there, I'd like to remind you that there is a, uh, another board that we would love for your participation in now, uh, which is called our Further Learning Whiteboard. Um, and you've seen it throughout the last uh, day and earlier this morning. There's a link for the further learning board in the chat. Um, and you might be wondering why are we asking you to contribute to yet another board? Um, this one in particular is actually selfishly for me. It's going to help myself and the members of the Helen Steering Group create spaces and opportunities for members to engage on these topics in the future. You are setting our agenda for us, and we are so grateful for your contributions. We're listening to your learning interest, and Helen is uh, here to respond. So after this session, if you have a burning question, if you have a topic that you think needs to be addressed, please add it to the board. I'm seeing... Um, need for evidence, tracking students in higher education, using systems to understand where our graduates go afterwards. Um, I'm seeing uh, vocational training. Uh, I'm seeing people that are wanting resources to provide adaptive software or equipment to support students with disabilities. A call back to our session earlier today with Waliwa. Absolutely agree with that. Having those uh, supports are necessary for access. Um, organizational structures to facilitate employability. So like, how do we think about institutions of higher education? How do we think about their infrastructure, their policies for faculty? Um, how do we think about how we how faculty spend time and the number of courses that they teach? Um, how can we use those organizational policies to shape faculty behaviors to engage in employability as a goal of the institution and have time for that? Yeah. And I'm seeing, you know, great, a link between practical and experiential learning. We've heard a lot about that today. Uh, and corruption, you know, uh, Kevin mentioned that as well earlier about, you know, the, the joy that he has in knowing that his job was earned on merit, but that um, corruption and bribes exist in the labor force and how can uh, higher education institutions and our partners work together to, to counteract that. So 
employability isn't just about the relationship between graduates and employers. It's uh, about higher education's role in society and the ways in which we can engage that um, and make meaningful changes across society. So thank you so much. Keep on contributing these ideas. I promise that Helen is listening to these and we are excited to, to respond to them. Okay, so what else uh, is next for you today? So um, right after this, we have a networking session. Um, so in our networking sessions, we're asking you to use the Whova platform to directly connect with individuals that you want to chat with, or you can go to the community section of the platform and create a meetup, um, maybe for your country or region of the world if you want to meet folks uh, in your neighborhood. Um, just a suggestion, but feel free to go to the community board, add a topic, contribute to the thoughts, message individuals in the chat. We have time to decide for networking so that you can keep these conversations going afterwards. Um, our summit is going to reconvene again next week, next Tuesday, May 17th, which is our final week of the summit. Um, on that day, we're going to be focusing on higher education and private sector engagement. We have heard that throughout the first two weeks about the importance of these relationships between higher education institutions and the private sector. And so that's going to, that day is really going to help us tie so many of these ideas and themes uh, that we've discussed together. Um, and we're actually going to be hearing from both um, private sector actors as well as government officials to help us bring that conversation and, and hear new voices in what those collaborations look like. So I'm very excited for that day. Um, and then don't forget our last day of the summit. I can't believe it's coming. It's Wednesday, May 18th. Um, that last day is very special. We will focus on convergence and tackling big questions about higher education in crisis and conflict affected settings and higher education's role in supporting democracy and student activism. These are both really important and timely questions that we know you will want to be a part of. So I suggest you right now go ahead, click on the agenda, which is on the left hand menu panel, add those sessions on Wednesday, May 18th to your personal agenda um, so that you can get reminders to join us. Um, and we don't we don't want you to miss them. So go ahead and, and mark them on your on your agenda now. And then while you're marking your agenda, I am going to do one more plug for the official launch of the Helen, which will also take place on May 18th. And we will have a special announcement on that last session of our summit and a call for concept notes to share. So be sure to sign up for the Helen by visiting uh, our website. Hopefully a link in the chat will be coming and you can sign up and join us uh, next week for this very special announcement um, and, and really a celebration moment uh, for us for, for the launch of Helen. We're going to be sharing some new ways that you can participate and I hope that you'll join us then. So until then, I will stop here and engage with you in the chat if you'd like, but stay safe, take care. Thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye.